Dr. David Savage, welcome along for our chat here today. Tell us, what is a behavioural economist? Okay, so a behavioural economist is at its heart uh, a, a crossover between all the social sciences. So it's a bit of psychology, a bit of sociology, a bit of anthropology. It's really looking at the way that we interact with our resources in the world around us and the way that we think about doing things. So as a behavioralist, I'm really interested in saying, well, why is it I will spend resources here, but not here? We saw at the start of this pandemic, people buying up big in supermarkets. Supermarket shelves were wiped of all different types of products. Was this panic buying or, or is this something else? Okay, so I've got to be careful with the term panic buying because panic tends to actually be represented poorly in movies and it comes from the Greek god Pan, which is uncontrollable behavior. Mm. And that is the problem, it wasn't uncontrolled. Uh, it was very, very targeted. So you could see that we ran out of toilet paper and hand sanitizer very fast. That was targeted, it wasn't random. So what was happening is people were seeing that in other places like Hong Kong, they ran out of toilet paper. And obviously different country, different context, but we have two major manufacturers here, we were never gonna run out, but some people were concerned. They were actually worried about losing out, so we have loss aversion, and they were worried that in the future, if they didn't buy it when they could, they'd feel really bad, they'd have regret. So what happens is some people started to buy, and then other people were seeing that, and this is where herd behavior kicks in. They're saying, those people are buying toilet paper. Do they know something I don't? Maybe I should be buying some toilet paper. And this is what happens is this grows. So the more people that do it, the bigger the group gets that, that does it. And the more that people observe that, the, the worse it looks. And it keeps on growing and growing and growing. And eventually, the number of people that are buying toilet paper out exceeds the supply chain system, which means that the, she the shelves run out. And once the shelves run out, people who thought there might be a problem are now convinced there's an empty shelf. We have a problem. So how does behavioral economics change the situation? How does it stop it? How does it prevent this from happening? Um, behavioural is basically understanding why people do things. It's not just the how. So we can, we can observe what people do, and that's fine. But you want to understand why they do those things. So why is it that they bought the toilet paper? Why is it that they bought it the hand sanitizer? So when you actually understand the why, you say, okay, as soon as we see the triggers that cause the why, then we can say, ah, now we know what they're going to do because we can see the why. We can actually take a leap backwards and say, right, in the supply chain, as soon as the why happens, you guys need to start sending more toilet paper or hand sanitizer because this is triggered that what we see next is going to be this event. This is what's going to happen. And we do it all the time. So policy is now starting to adopt these ideas of behavioral insights to actually say, why do people do this? Can we help them? We've seen an awful lot of change in the economy in a, in a really short amount of time. How do you see these changes shaping where we're heading into the future? I think we're actually at a really big point now of, of a nice, it'll call the word reset, it's a nice reset. And what we're going to see is Depending on the duration of this, we're either going to go back to where we were, which I hope we don't happen, or we have a complete change of system, which I think will happen. So habits take about eight weeks to change, and if anybody's tried to quit smoking, you'll, you'll tell them all about it, eight weeks. Um, but people have been basically living in, in, uh, at home in lockdown, they haven't been going to cafes, they haven't been going out to nightclubs, they, there's a lot of things they haven't been doing for a while. Once you remove all the, all the, all the lockdowns and the, and the barriers, they're not gonna go straight back and do it again. So they're gonna start thinking about, well, maybe I don't need to do this, which means they've already started to change their behavior. Now, this will flow onto the economy, because if people say, look, I don't need to buy coffee 15 times a day like I normally do, which means I only buy three coffees a day, which means every coffee shop's gonna go, where's Dave? Um, they're gonna start seeing lower turn down of business. That's gonna mean there's gonna be lower turn down, lower re requirement for casual employments or baristas and that everything's going to start to shrink on that side and you can see this is going to go the longer this goes on the bigger this effect's going to be if it goes on long enough and, to, and it goes into a more of a depression rather than a recession we can see that you actually have, might have a whole generation of kids that grow up in a very different world to the one we had just before covid there may not be a lot of part-time jobs there may not be a lot of free casual money floating around we will actually see people behaving and taking up activities that don't cost a lot of money a lot of 20-somethings who are going through this at the moment and have probably led a very prosperous life, they may have lost their job or the industry they're working in at the moment. They will experience and are experiencing a lot of change, but heading forward, this is not necessarily going to be a bad thing as we see this reset take place. Oh no, so every major change in, in uh, human history has come usually at a cost and it's usually a big shock event. Um, but think about going forward, so and you look at the news, the first time in India they've seen the Himalayas for a really long time because of pollution. Beijing's had you know, breathable air, so you can actually see that the environment's changed. And we're at this point now going, well we can go back to where we were, we can keep on burning fossil fuels, we can keep on doing these things, 
Or we can take the advantage of this and say, look, while we're in, a, in this, this shutdown and a slowdown period, how about we push forward into renewables and we go into recycling and all these things that we've kind of held off on because it looked really expensive while we were having business as usual. So any of those industries now, they're primed to grow, they're primed to explode, and there's going to be jobs in the future in those industries. So obviously, that is going to come at a cost. The flip side of that is all the things that made the pollution, they may not fare so well. David, there has been a lot of doom and gloom through this whole COVID-19 crisis, both here in Australia and around the world, but there really is a silver lining coming out of it. Oh, without a doubt. I think the best thing about this event is we've sort of forced ourselves to stop. We've all been in isolation, whether together or alone, and we've really had to think about, and we've been forced to confront the things that we actually value. We've started thinking about the things that we miss and why we miss them. It hasn't been the things, it's been the doing. We miss our friends, we miss the park, we miss our dog, all those sorts of things. And I think going forward, we're gonna have to really consider, well, what is it that I want about going next? What do I want? What do I wanna buy? You know, do I need all these things? So I think we're gonna really start to consider the way that we live going forward. And I think we really will end up with a much better society because we will actually have now have to have the chance to stop and think about what we want. David, fascinating insights. Thank you for your time. And thanks also to the University of Newcastle for the support of the community. Well, thank you very much for having me here. I love talking to people about this. I, I think that the more we talk about this, the better off we're going to be. And I'm really thankful for the Greater Bank for giving me the opportunity to talk about what we do at the university and the, especially what I do in behavioral economics. Thank you.